Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mine. I'm your host, as always, James B. Gesso. This is a Halloween bonus episode, and because it's a Halloween bonus episode, you can probably hear the skrish skrish of my feet. I'm actually outside. Um, I am outside uh, in the forest, and uh, hoping to give you a little taste of what the late autumn southwestern Ontario environment looks like. And, uh, yeah, so this is a Halloween bonus episode. It's not a Halloween-themed episode, though, at least not really. Um, you probably saw in the title of this episode, it said magic. And, well, I mean, most people, when they think of magic, probably think of sleight of hand tricks or Las Vegas. Um, or they might think of witches or warlocks, or they might think of the kind of thinking that gets uh, some of us in the psychedelic community in a bit of trouble from time to time. Um, but those aren't the types of magic that we're talking about here today. We're talking about magic with a K. Uh, ritualistic magic, which might make you think of Aleister Crowley, for example. Um, but yes, we're gonna talk about ritualistic magic, but we're not gonna talk about occult magic so much so as pop magic. We're gonna talk with Alex Kazemi, who wrote this book, Pop Magic, A Simple Guide to Bending Your Reality. And uh, what the difference is between pop magic and traditional forms of occult magic will become evident as we, uh, as we go through the interview. Um, but let me read you a little bit about Alex's bio. I got only one hand here, so pardon me a second. Okay, so Alex's bio. Alex Kazemi is a pop artist, creative director, author, and cultural deprogrammer. His work has been featured on Apple Music, Dazed, ID, Playbook, Resident Advisor, King Kong, V Magazine, Paper, and Oyster, among others. He served as features editor for the inaugural edition of King Kong Garçon. He lives in Vancouver. That's out of the back of his book, Pop Magic. Okay, so Alex is sort of like a a well-accomplished pop artist. So like making things for pop media, like magazine co covers with Diplo and a full feature film shot exclusively on Snapchat. Um, and he has written this book about ritualistic magic, essentially how to use magical rituals to bend reality to accord with your divine will. Now, for some of you, that's gonna, that's gonna sound a little hokey pokey um, and fair enough. But give the episode a watch, give the interview a listen, and, and see what you think. Um, I thought it was pretty fun, and I've been having some interesting experiences uh, playing around with uh, some of the things that Alex uh, shares as, as possibilities inside of pop magic. And at the very least, as a metaphor or framework for understanding how our engagement with our own minds uh, and our engagement with reality can be directly altered through our conscious will, through ritualistic practices, and that on the other side of such rituals, interesting and strange and totally synchronistic events can occur. So um, that's what this interview is, that's what it's about. So. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, before I get into it, I'll give a huge thanks to my patrons on Patreon. This might be a nice place to go into the forest. A big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for making this podcast possible. Uh, without your support, it wouldn't be happening at all. So thank you very much. And um, these people, <laughs> I'm navigating the forest, sorry, so I'm not entirely focused. Uh, the people who are listed on the screen here on YouTube have been giving significantly, some of which for quite a long time. And so an extra thank you to them. For everyone who is not yet a patron but would like to support the show, please do. Um, you can do so by going to jamesdbjesso.com forward slash support. There you'll find options for Patreon. You'd also find options for doing a cryptocurrency donation like Bitcoin, Litecoin, or Ethereum. Uh, or you can do a one-time PayPal donation. Uh, either way, options are also listed in the description to this episode wherever you are checking it out. So thank you very much for supporting the show financially. I really appreciate it. Uh, without further ado, here is my interview with Alex Kazemi here on Adventures Through the Mind. And on the outro, I will show you a little bit more of the forest that I'm in. Okay. Enjoy. Well, where do we start? Uh, all right. So, I mean, it might be, it might be sort of like uh, on some level... 
inaccurate to be releasing this episode as like a as a Halloween bonus episode or something. Um, but also, we're going to talk about magic um, and oh, Halloween, yeah. hocus pocus, magic, demons, uh, whatever else. I mean, my my personal favorite holiday uh, since I was a kid, since I was somewhat obsessed with everything that my parents told me I was not allowed to engage with, which is, of course, the world of Satan. Uh, oh. de- demons, you know, the demonic. My father was a Jehovah's Witness when I was growing up. So anything that didn't fit the fit the mold, it was either it was either sort of like the confused other Christians or demonic. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was like those two things. And so in my mind, I was like, demonic. And he was like, you got to stay away from that. It's so intense. And I'm like, yeah, but what about the demonic? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> what about Freddy Krueger? <laughs> um, so yeah, what's that? <laughs> no, I said a demon's name, but I shouldn't say that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Don't, don't don't bring that into my show. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. All right. So wh- why don't why don't we start here then? Because we're not we're not here to talk about. Although we are kind of here to talk about pop culture and pop to some degree, uh, we're going to talk about pop magic. But let's start with magic in general. Like what what is okay, it? Yeah. yeah. So what 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 is magic? Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's the art and science of bending reality in accordance with your true will. And I think it's it's how to completely free yourself from dogma, from institutionalized thinking and to completely bend your reality to your will. But then okay, so that that makes sense. But then what what does that mean? Like what what does that mean? So that that's that's what it is. And then what what does that mean though? Like what does that look like? Oh, well, I mean, I I would say that magic is how you can materialize the life that you want and and how you can change reality to and and what that means to me is to to fight through the co- constructions in your mind of limits to to create change in the world through ritual, through natural energy, using natural energy, um, whether we don't know how magic works, we just know that it works, whether it's angels or spirits that we're sending our energy out, whether that by default, we were born with the ability to create a reality and it's been hidden from us. But um, all we know is, is that magic works. And I feel, um, I feel it's necessary to materialize the things that you want so you can realize that those material world things are not the answer, but you need to go through that process. And magic is a great way to kickstart it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think my first encounter with magic, I didn't realize was magic. Um, and it was through, um, oh, was it Napoleon Hill? He had sort of like a chapter about yeah. like auto, auto hypnosis. Um, yeah. And just like basically utilizing auto hypnotic practices to 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 like seed into your subconscious mind a a certain sort of slant towards pattern recognition to move yourself towards and bring in things in your life of your choosing, and then I got into a little bit more of like the occult side of things. I've read up on that sort of stuff, um, Crowley and, uh, yeah. and and that sort of like world, not too deeply. And I've met many magic practitioners in my life who have, are heavy into that sort of occult side of things. Um, and then like, basically it came down to ultimately doing sigils about stuff that I, that I appreciate, uh, wanting to bring into my life. But I find myself, um, wondering about this because I think it's easy to kind of get a really trivial idea in our minds, uh, for people like myself, for example, tends to be more agnostic. And admittedly, I have in the past been a little bit more judgmental of anything that looked new agey. I mean, after I came out of my very new agey phase and, um, and it's, so- it sounds kind of new agey. And uh, on another end, it sounds interesting. Cause what you're, what I hear you talking about is utilizing ritualistic practices at the most secular. Okay. Utilizing yeah. ritualistic practices to reprogram your subconscious mind to be more in accordance with your choosing rather than being an automatic byproduct of the sort of hypnotic uh, theater of modern culture dictating yep. the whys and the what's and the meaning of it all for you in a way that is ultimately generally, um, if you look around and look within, pretty destructive. So wh- where am I on base there? Where, what am I missing? You you nailed it. You know Napoleon Hill is the witch. You know he he he's, he everything he talks about is magic and a lot of the new age. And that's the disappointing part about when you discover the occult and magic, you realize that it's the same as the new agers. They're they're all 
practicing the same thing. Whereas, you know, like you said, the modern theater, a lot of people try to um, make the occult into something more separatist and ego based. And, you know, well, I have power, I can read that Crowley book and and evoke all these spirits. And, and, and I was trying to do by this book by saying, you know what, let's get down to the bare bones of alchemy and magic. And like you said, the theater of modern culture is all spectacle. It's all energy. It's all hijacking our energy. Therefore, the way to reverse that project, um, product of, of ourselves is, is to reverse it through magic. And like you said, sigils is a great way because we're being programmed by sigils all the time that are telling us to give up our energy. And um, we are, you know, a, a culture that is obsessed with surfaces and illusions. And we just think of how, you know, much we've been programmed by TV and media for so many years and how there's so much in our subconscious mind that we didn't really ask to have in our mind. And this is kind of the process that I'm, I'm wanting to kickstart in people to be like, you know what, how would I go through my mind and rake through it and take out what doesn't belong to me and give it back to society and i feel like magic is a great way to get clear like get clear get it get into a zero mind state and and who are you you know i think magic really creates that process for people especially when you get what you want Hmm. i think there's a number of pieces i want to comment on um getting what you want i don't think i want to go there yet because i want to talk about sort of like selfishness and uh misappropriation of power um maybe later later on or inappropriate use of, of, of power uh, later on. Um, but I'm wondering like, okay, so we're talking about this and it sounds, now we're talking about what sounds like very secular language. It's about reprogramming the mind um, yeah. from the from the the condition that it's in as a consequence of the large propaganda machine that has dictated our, the meaning of our lives since we were born inside of the capital, cor- corpro capitalist, materialist culture that we're currently in, or in North America. Um, and yet, you also said things like natural energy and witches and angels. I'm, is there, is there, what's the necessity of talking about these sort of more new agey things if it sounds like such a secular thing? Does the secular approach, is it missing something that, that is fundamentally present there? Or can it all be explained through Occam's raisin, razor? And is the rest just our own sort of poetic theory, uh, theater of the mind to make it interesting? Well, I think you you hit on a really good point about you know what what is the ne- what is the necessity for a higher power? Why why do we bring in spirits? Why do we bring in angels? Why do we bring in these things? Um, I think because the material world in itself doesn't fulfill people, and we and we know that. And I think um, the reason that people who practice magic or discover the occult usually are in a very powerless state. They're looking for a sense of power. They're looking to feel a sense of power. And when you have, when you create an entity like an angel or a demon or anything, and you you build a secure attachment to something in the upper world, you, you, you can, you transcend to this idea that there's more than just me and I can, I can be a part of a bigger divine picture and a bigger divine will. And I feel like, you know, you also made a great point too. You know, it's like, I often think about that as well. You know, is magic and the occult and our interest in these things just another aspect of the theater of the mind and, you know, needing fantasy and needing to go into, to leave ourselves and needing to go into different worlds. But from practicing and studying practitioners, I see that there's a very material world effect that that makes it um, more about building a reality that is is something closer to your mind and what you want and what you envision. But like like you said, there is such a bait and switch about it. There's there's selfishness. There's ego. There's power. There's darkness in this path. Hundred percent. Hmm. So. When you say making the reality that you want, and things come up in material reality. So I, I can definitely a- account for things that I've done that are, I, I've only done sigil kind of magic. As far as I know, actually, having, uh, having a history in New Ageism and a lot of uh, psychedelic work, shamanic type work, and a lot, of, a lot of that I don't talk about on the podcast very much because it's not sort of front of mind um, with my current sort of way in the world. Uh, but I have had things happen that seem like pretty secret-esque 
I set myself a thing and then a, an actual thing came into my life. But then I've had other experiences, which is sort of strange where it's so uncanny that a, that something I set forth for myself previously would come into existence in such a s synchronistic or at the very least like coincidental way so perfectly that yeah. it it definitely sort of accounts for a mystery about the thing that isn't explainable just by saying well my subconscious mind was programmed for pattern recognition because um yeah well, i mean maybe it could be but it seems like there's just so much more maybe operating beyond the self that that's being tapped into but i don't i'm still remain pretty agnostic as to what that thing is um and and it makes me wonder about your suggestion about you know like having some control over reality which calls me into a question of like what is reality in your mind here in the, in this magical thing uh, that you're that you're that you're talking about like is is reality of your choosing is reality something objective does reality include spirit worlds or spirits with entity or agency beyond us or is everything just a creation of the human mind what i mean those are a lot of questions at once so i just want you to run with the question of like so what what, what is reality here that it is that we're that we're tapping into that creates this magical result yeah. yeah, I think that, you know, reality to me, it, obviously subjective, but I also feel like reality has a lot to do with perception and what we choose to focus on. And I feel like that's why society is always after our perception, because they're trying to hijack our view of reality and put it on their view so that we that we can consume and we can live in that, you know, plug into that movie their their version of reality but reality i feel like in itself i feel like the for me personally the material world feels like uh, like a hallucination like it feels like like a artificial it feels like an illusion in a lot of ways and i feel like that's why so many people who accomplish the things they want go, why didn't this change me? Why did this add more to the illusion? Why did this make things more difficult? Why, why, why did the thing that I thought I would materialize and that would change me make things even more of an illusion and push me more into the illusion? Well, what if off right, this is all essentially an illusion of our soul, of our path, and that maybe we came here and chose to incarnate um, like the Kabbalists say that, you know, we chose every event in our life and we chose to experience everything to grow from it and to to get closer to ascension and spiritual ascension. But, you know, I also empathize with the idea of uh, auto-suggestion and focusing on things that, to create a reality and, and just, oh, you're just becoming more aware of that. But like you said, it's too bizarre. The synchronicities Sometimes, and the paranormalities. Yeah. It's like, how could I, I would be dumb to say that I know everything and that I can just define reality for what it is, is that I'm the be end all authoritative person who can just reduce this to something. It's like, no, I think what makes magic interesting is, is that this is so uh, confusing and complex and it and it brings these different dimensions and barriers of ourselves into the picture and and it challenges reality and it challenges the normal and i think that's that's probably the greatest aspect of the occult is that if you don't fall into secular dogmatic religious type thinking um you you'll you'll start to have a freer mind hmm. interesting so freer freer in what sense Freer in the way that you 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 challenge what you consume, and you're not you're not uh, you're interrogating the surfaces. You're interrogating everything in a way where you are observing and 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 being aware of your experience, rather than you know submitting to to a dogma or a program of what people are saying, whether it's in identity politics, whether it's in pop culture, whether it's in a movie that everyone loves or an album everyone loves, you have to listen to your instincts, your individual taste, your taste buds, those things that make you a spark of the universe are, are, are essentially connected to the magic that you have to offer to the world and bring to the world. Hmm. So, um, so then what you just described is sort of a, a paradigm of, of under a paradigm of engagement with reality as it arises. And then yeah. the practices of magic 
would be a means by which that perspective is then channeled to direct one's will into that reality to get some sort of echo response. Yeah. And also to remove the powerlessness that ca- the, that capitalism and, and, and mater- the materialist society and, and the hierarchical aristocracy and, you know, um, all of the, the sectors of, of culture and the, 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 comp- the competitiveness, the ego, all of that, like to, to, to put yourself and be like, you know what, I can, I will, and I am, and I'm going to do it. And then you, you're, you will do it. And I believe that you can, and, and, and you will manifest what you need to manifest. But, uh, when you get there, you'll realize you'll be challenged in a way that you've never been challenged before to figure out, well, I have my material world uh, uh, desire, and it, all it is is another illusion in, in the simulation. It's another uh, illusion in the reality I'm simulating. So what is the bigger purpose? Where is the real fulfillment? Where do I go now? And that would be the next level after pop magic which is what i'm i'm trying to push people to manifest the things that they want to learn that this is not the answer Hmm. so what i'm hearing is um well and you also mentioned pop magic which we haven't differentiated from magic as it's sort of understood in occult circles which is a question for later on but you mentioned okay you what's the point here Where, where where am i entering in you mentioned you know we are always sort of manifesting a thing and again yeah. very secular approach we're doing a stuff we're working towards goals and yeah. we achieve those goals or we don't when we do achieve those goals we at, we we taste the meaning of it and we auto correct along the way and that the perspective what you're saying here is that sort of the baseline for how we understand reality from a magical perspective is this constant challenge of why is it that we're being told to basically challenging everything so that there's a greater sense of not having one's will be directed by the larger theater of society as it stands, but instead have a greater capacity to recognize the deeper wants and the deeper needs and the deeper sort of meaningful directions, and then allocate one's goals in that direction. And then the magical practices are an added layer of tapping into states of consciousness and states of ritualistic impact that sort of invite reality to harmonize with your will and that direction that you've now chosen based on having had this sort of critical deconstruction of reality as you were given and a tapping in with a deeper connection of your own sort of will and being in the world. Boom, slam dunk. Exactly, exactly. And I feel like and I feel like you you just hit on a huge point is is that you have to learn about the deeper desire beneath the surface level material world thing that you want because the deeper desire is how you fulfill the soul, the higher self. And I think when you get to that place and, and you and you and you bridge yourself, you build that bridge from the material uh, desire to the spiritual desire, you'll start to naturally become more disaffected and detached from the highs and lows of the material world by the statistics by the competition, by the simulation, by the game, the lack matrix, all of that stuff, because you're, you'll start to see it all in the same color. It's all one thing. It's all one illusion. Even when you have really good stuff happening, if you can be disaffected by that and detached, that when you get excited about it and you, and you, and you, you give it power, you then become powerless. So, you know, the next level of magic to me would be trying to sustain a sense of, of inner peace despite the external supply of the material world and external gravi- uh, gratification. And in, tw- in the 2020s, you know, this is the economy of e- external in- instant gratification. This is it, you know, like this is, we're living in a virtual video game every day. Mm. that they so, groomed us to be in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or we have been accidentally co-groomed into uh over generations i'm not sure yeah you know it could be could be just like a natural mistake we all like some guiding principles created for ourselves um that's very beautiful to describe social media <laughs> <laughs> uh so my oh i'm just noticing my my lighting is really terrible anyways distraction um so 
Okay. You say there's a lot of individualistic... Also, can you try to stay in the center? That's uh, just for the split screen later. It won't cut you off. Um, the way that... What you're describing sounds very individualistic. Okay. Yeah. And even the idea of like, you know... I, I like your disaffected, like getting to a place of being disaffected by even the positive. It has a very stoic slant to it. Um, but I'm wondering about, it sounds very individualistic. It sounds very much about me and my will, right? And then about getting what you want, which yeah. you did, although you're speaking against material, the material world, which I think you mean more than actually like stuff and things and money and stuff. Um it sounds very materialistic. Get what I want. It sounds very selfish. Get what I want about me and my will. Yeah. And my question here is then, but what about being in relationships? If, if, if we challenge and confront everything and only move towards being in alignment with things that are about me and my will, about getting what I want, how does that, how does that fit into also wanting to be in healthy, positive relationships with people who may or may not agree with your worldview. And on top of that, you had also made a comment about getting to a place where you're working towards helping bring into reality your magic as if the magic that you're bringing in is something reality needs. Like like that the, that the person having been birthed into being, that being, it's, it's sort of deepest expression of its own uniqueness is a gift onto the reality it's being within as yeah. long as we can connect with that. But then how does that, how does that layer over into selfishness and self-centered sort of my will and what I'm doing for making reality, what I want, this kind of stuff. But this is how, you know, the new age world, um, the, the magic world, the occult world is extremely self-deceptive because it's very difficult for people to go down this path of manifesting the things they want with occult tools without becoming extremely selfish and ext without believing that they're becoming huger as and more powerful as they're manifesting the things that they want, which is just a symptom and a byproduct of the abuse of free will. But I don't think that's very easy for people to understand until something happens with that level of behavior and that abuse of power to realize that, like you said, collectiveness, helping each other out, unity, positive relationships, um, and being the opposite of isolation and separation, because the reason we live in such an addicted society is because we are, for that exact reason of what you just said, is because we program ourselves to be egotistical and isolated and alone and individual in our will. But I think a real powerful kind of magic would be a collective magic that connects us. But the reason I wrote pop magic was because it, in a way it's a parody of, of our culture and it's a parody of the occult world. And I'm, and I'm talking about my own experiences in the book about pop culture because i'm using it as a metaphor of the false worship that we have in our culture for for putting celebrities on god gods and goddess pedestals when in reality they're equal to us and i feel like um that need for archetypes in our society is a real thing we do need higher archetypes but i think we should question who our idols are and who we worship is as well hmm Hmm, interesting. Um, all of a sudden, I was like, "Krishna is equal to us," <laughs> <laughs> but that's maybe a whole other a whole other layer of discussion there. Um, well, why don't you why don't you point out a little bit point a bit to pop magic because one of the things that you talk about in the book um, as this sort of like sort of uh, criticism about about the pop world and about sort of magic's sort of ability to leverage around that, like you just described. Um, you also sort of point towards occult practices that are sort of traditioned or occult traditions and they're and, and them doing something similar that it's about like it has to be like this and it has to be like that and to like to this to this spirit and this thing and, and so on and so forth and that that itself is its own sort of like you said you were talking about dogma it's its own dogma which sort of like traps oneself into uh what's the word i'm looking for into into a theater that was made by somebody else not by oneself 
Yeah, it's it, 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 it's it's really if if you're reading Alistair Crowley's books and 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 doing the exact things that you know the OTO rituals do and all that kind of stuff, you are no different to me than a Christian, or you're no different than a, someone who is living by a, a a form of rules and dogma that you are doing mostly out of a desire to connect to a higher power or to gain power or to gain something for yourself. But I dislike that aspect of the occult community of perfectionism. And um, this is the way we do magic. This is how you do it. I know I'm the right one, which is why I wrote the book was because I was like, okay, you know, how can we cut this down to the bare bones and have people interpret it and create their own versions of those rituals because ritual is, is beautiful. Like, you know, if you want to light a candle every full moon and have and, and attune yourself to the rhythms of nature, ritual is beautiful. There are beautiful rituals in all religions, all spiritualities, but for people who are cynical, skeptical of dogma and institutionalized thinking and have been burned by it, magic can be a way to be a non-discriminatory spiritual option if you use it in a way where you say, no, 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 I'm not going to listen to that book. I'm going to light a red candle and do a success spell instead of a green candle. And you, you start to add yourself into it. And I think when you do that, you start to learn about your own individual tastes, your own style, your own fucking hate this word, aesthetic. But I think, you know, I think that it's, it's really important for people to be themselves when they practice magic because magic becomes another way for people to have a story about themselves and identity. It's like the people who watch the craft for the first time and go buy a pentagram ring and then they fall down that and then they build a whole other illusion of themselves. It's like, how can we in interact with the power of this practice without making it theater? That's a challenge, I think. Hmm. So then it, it, is there no value in these traditions? Like I, I think about a word, right? If I, yeah. and this is a reference to a guy I have followed quite a while, Stephen Jenkinson and his, his work around etymology. It's like uh, our language is like a kelp forest. And if you take any particular words and you start tracking down their history, it's like going down from the top of the really whooshy kelpy bits and you get down and it's just like big honking hunks of kelp dug right into the earth. Yeah. And that, and that, Whenever you speak a word now, even with its own modern we, uh, meaning, you're still evoking to some level the ancient history of that word. And I personally believe, and I think you'd be with me, that words are themselves a type of magic or can be used as a yeah. type of magic. And so if if recognizing the power of dipping into the to the ancient traditions of a language, can access sort of the the sort of cumulative impact of that tradition's existence over time in language as a as a as a thing then is it not possible and then perhaps valuable to do the same with a cultural tradition around a, a ritual well I, of course i believe that you know there are sigils and symbols that are timeless and 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 you know Hebrew texts and Sanskrit mantras and all of these things that are extremely powerful form forms of of, uh, of of rhythm and and nature and energy and vibration and repetition. And you're right. There's something that is something powerful about connecting to the ancient collective energy and history of a certain ritual. But I think that's not for everybody. Hmm. I think. I think it can be extremely overwhelming when certain people discover the occult and they're like, Oh, I have to do the lesser banishing ritual pentagram ritual, you know, and, and do the, do the Crowley rituals and wear the, wear the robes and, and do all this type of stuff. But I feel like, um, you know, calling on the elements, that type of stuff is, is chill, but there's not a right or correct way to do it, hmm. you know, because, Personally, like I say in the book, like this was is very controversial, but I believe that entities are spirits who take on the role of entities when you call them on. I don't think there's like a specific one fixed all entity. I think that you can vibrate to a frequency of an entity that you discover in a book and create them through the archetype that you hallucinate and project onto your imagination in your reality. And then 
that that's how it works. But you're getting the ideas from the books of the archetypes, because if you didn't see these books and you didn't know these archetypes, you wouldn't know how to articulate their traits. So that's why I push people in the book, create your own entities. What do you need? What are the angels you need? What are the, I mean, I would, I don't, I don't encourage people to create demons, but you know what, maybe there's a fairy, there's a fae or a mermaid or something you need to create. And maybe that mermaid or whatever will bring you something in, in the same way you read, um, in a magic book about an angel like Raziel or something, you know, you can, I, I see it all in the same. And that really upsets people because I am against tradition in a lot of ways. Hmm. So do you think, and then we'll go into spirits here, right? So spirits, entities, you're saying that the, that, that we are creating the entities with our mind and the yep. way that it manifests to us subjectively is a sort of like a, a willful hallucination that we're going through to interact with particular spirits or spiritual energies so that there's some sort of transformation in ourselves and change in reality. Is that yeah. kind of what you're suggesting? Well, and I think that that the the only way you can vibrate is through the emotion and the vibration that you you match with that's in the spirit world to get to get with you and i think that's why they always say entities demons feed off of fear lust hate you know all these things become attached the shamans will always tell you oh that's how you get demons stuck on you and i think that's because the lower vibrational uh, spirits i'm not saying low or high good means good or bad i'm saying low or high is how we account the hierarchy of energies in, in, in energy and magic and in the spirit world. So a higher vibrational frequency, you might be able to match with a spirit that will take on that role of that angel for you and support you. But um, I, I think it, it's difficult, you know, because because then that, 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 that can be challenged by saying, well, but what if their actual are like, that's, that's my next question. Seven feet entities in those upper worlds that are not spirits. What if they are those things? I don't know. I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of hard to go past that. And you're like, I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, the question doesn't continue. But that 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 is part of the I guess part of the humility maybe in being like, yeah, reality is stranger than stranger than, than we me. can can explain, right? Certainly with. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and there are certain places where it's like, yeah, these are the ideas. And some of these ideas seem to be pragmatic. They seem to work. They seem to be holding somewhat true. They seem to, when embraced, true me in the way that a wheel is true to turn straight. But I don't know if it's real. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like it might be yeah. a bunch of just fiction in my head. And so that's, that's interesting. Because when you were talking about spirits, I thought about Krishna, for example. You know, like Krishna is a powerful spiritual being i, I mean that yeah. from from the premise i don't know that for sure you know but then it's like if i meditate on krishna and i do devotional practice to krishna and i have these powerful experiences am i just making krishna up in my mind or is there actually a krishna i'm connecting with and or is it just a spiritual energy of something that has just happened to always manifest in a particular way when encountered by human consciousness exactly so it's like if Krishna was a different name and you still subscribe to that much you you put it on the highest level of power would you have the same transcendent experiences with Krishna with knockoff Krishna or Krishna 2.0 that you create in your head maybe I would say yes you know I mean look at you know it's a great example that I've been putting together because I've been going to so much fucking 12 step and like zoom groups and and like um doing like addiction therapy and in, in, in quarantine is why does everyone's lives change when they bring in the higher power? Why, why, why is it that the higher power missing is the solution? Is that because intrinsically we do need a concept of spirituality of a higher power to survive this, like sometimes fucked up human experience, which sometimes <laughs> we, we want to subject ourselves to self-destructive destructiveness and apathy and nihilism and hit self-destruct and say, fuck it all, burn it all to the ground. Cause there are days where sometimes people feel that way. You know, even the most spiritual people feel that way because, because this human experience in itself is so mysterious and complex. And in a way, some people would say unasked for, 
you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, I've been thinking about that a lot because I've been struggling with like understanding my own addiction and the disease of addiction, or I don't know if I like the word disease to describe addiction, but why do I constantly, why have I constantly had this desire to leave? Like why, why is reality in itself so unbearable that I have to leave it to not tolerate it? And I've been thinking about that in terms of magic a lot as well. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, my immediate suggestion is that you should look into a good somatic based trauma informed specialist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, no. like relational somatic therapy, Sharon, Sharon Stanley kind of kind of stuff might be helpful. Um, I mean, on some level, you know, on some level, that's an interesting thing, too, because the sort of magic as a as a sort of a, a as a as a metaphorical language to explain dynamics of reality could be, you know, like superimposed on a number of things, including psychotherapy, especially sort of relational somatic type psychotherapy, where oh, yeah. it's around creating ritualistic containers for certain biological and psychological processes to unfold in a yeah. way where one person, the client, is resonating, harmonizing, and regulating with another person, the therapist, who is holding a particular physiological emotional yeah. relational disposition yeah. around which that or into which that person can regulate through a process of then a psychological meaning making and meaning transforming experience about the things that once wounded them in a way that has a deeply biological impact and a psychological impact afterwards which itself sounds like a pretty magical ish ish kind of ritual but it's also somatic psychotherapy <laughs> yeah no i, I mean Therapy and 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 the recovery community are alchemists. It's alchemy. You're going through a form of alchemy, and by because you're going deep within your unconscious, your shadow self, you're pulling out the 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 chips that you're operating off of on autopilot, and you're reformatting yourself. And that's a really incredible experience. And I honestly, you know, believe what the Kabbalists say. You know that we did come with soul corrections and we're here to elevate and you know in our reactive autopilot behavior we need to we can't just look at that and be like yeah you know what i'm just going to continue to be a fucking asshole no i think doing the conscious work on yourself is the real fulfillment and i don't think people can get to that place until i mean some people are blessed and they get to that place real quick but i think you know, material world, uh, getting the things that you want, because remember, we're all, everyone's always in a state of desire and lack and like, oh, well, if I have this, then I'll be this. When I have this, I'll be equal. And when I, when I do that, I'll be included. So, okay, do those things, get included, get, do, do all of it, but uh, it's not going to work. You're not going to find fulfillment in it. And you're going to have to challenge your desires and what you wanted and completely reformat your life. And I feel like that is like a next level alchemical process that I have had to go through in my own life. Hmm. Hmm. Do you want to, do you want to talk about that a bit? I mean, this is a podcast about psychedelics. I'm going to ask you about drug magic in a minute, you know, but it's also a podcast where I've, we talk quite a lot about, uh, you know, like healing with psychedelics and healing with, psychotherapeutic models as well as shamanic models of psychedelics and of course one of the sort of central discoveries both anecdotally in the underground and presently in the in the in the medical literature is that psychedelics help with addiction right so i think yeah. there's a direct connection here to the theme like do you feel comfortable and open talking about your 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 sort of journey with addiction and where magic has sort of like where it has helped and where you have found that it has not yet helped or hasn't yeah, yeah, I'm fine with talking about that. Yeah, I feel like, um, well, obviously, like I, I, I faced a lot of you know trauma, like anyone else in my childhood, and I, I, I developed a sense of disconnection and isolation, and I turned to pretty much every material world uh, thing that you can be addicted to, uh, to to want to black out and to want to destroy myself and destroy my ego and to, to create a sense of comfort, and. Um, I relied on a lot of external resources because of addiction. Um, but magic kind of cr started to ma – magic is actually part of – was and at first it was a dark aspect of the addiction. It actually encouraged my external world desires at first because it, it gave me a platform to uh, become – 
kind of the hugest version of myself, the most fantasy version of myself to live in the deepest aspect of the illusion. And when the bubble popped and I, I kind of came back to reality, I had to create a new relationship with magic. I had to create a relationship with magic where I was like, okay, well, how can I believe that the things that are out of my control are a part of a higher dimensional event that I chose before I came here and actually take responsibility for my life and take accountability for my life. And how can I, you know, build a relationship with the moon and the upper worlds and a secure attachment to heal my anxious, uh, attachment or my even avoidant attachment with people and family and all of this stuff and start to practice a healthier attachment with the upper worlds or an angel or with a God or a goddess and, and to heal at that sense of, of, of secureness rather than that inconsistency of anxious attachment. So I, I actually have used magic to help addiction because I think magic, uh, I mean, I think addiction is really about, um, an inability to connect with others. And I think, uh, addiction teaches you that your mismanagement and your inability to connect to others can be alchemized. And I feel like for me, it's difficult because when you, when you go through the recovery process, you, there's a lot of grief. Like right now I feel a lot of grief. Like I, I miss, I miss acting out. I miss those things because they, they, they provided such a sensory overload and an intensity to reality. And now I'm searching for healthier versions of intensity that are more fulfilling and long lasting and magic is, has helped me in that way as well. Hmm. And, and wh- where, mm, where do you see the magic so far not helping you and how are you orienting around? It? Is there anywhere where, it, where you've been like, Oh, this, this is, this is not getting me where I'm hoping to go or do, or is it something more like, well, the time frame hasn't been long enough. So I'm still just trusting the process. Well, I feel like um, when I did very egotistical magic for myself and because I had a low self-worth and behind um, a kind of manicured facade that I was painting of myself to the public, I I really, when I, when I took away doing the magic for those things and I, and I stopped going into that ego monster huge state and the, living off of the highs and lows and come downs, I had to resolve the pain beneath all of my desire and magic brought me to that place so in a way everything in a way of my recovery leads back to ritual and magic it's almost like it catapulted the process Hmm. cool let's move into some like practical discussion about magic one of the things you talk about in your book is like inside the ritual you get into a, a zero point state to charge yeah. things. Yeah. So maybe you could give us the the template for what a magical ritual looks like. And I don't mean that I'll, I'll ask, I specifically want to ask you about, there's a number of things in your book, but I want to ask you specifically about uh, sigils because they're very approachable. Cand- I have a specific personal question about candle magic, um, sex magic and drug magic. But yeah. I kind of want to get a sense of like, what is the anatomy of a magical ritual? Okay, so magic, everything in a ritual is a prop. It's an extension of something you are charging your will and directing it and focusing. You're, it's like an archer, and you're pulling it back, a bow and arrow, and you're pulling it to a bullseye. You're just directing your focus towards something and your energy, and you're taking the time to do that. And in doing so, that's all happening astrally. But through a ritual like candle magic or sigil magic, you're creating the physical embodiment of your desire. You're, you're, you're charging it and letting it and releasing it into the physical world. Um, and usually, unfortunately, this is really boring, but magic is visualization. It's, it's visualizing the end result with the feeling that you desire. And it's imbued with uh, moon phases and certain, for some people, you know, full moons, new moons, dark of the moon, um, a light of the moon. And for me, 
I've I've realized that you know the simplest forms of magic is that you can do it anywhere. I could I could do a spell with my my key to my house, close close my hand, close my eyes, hold it, visualize on a full moon, and it could work. But you can do that same ritual with a candle or a sigil. It's all about what works for you. But the problem is is that with the occult community, people feel very overwhelmed. By where do I start? How do I do this properly? Am I going to fuck this up? Blah, blah, blah. But really, magic all comes from you producing natural energy or drawing down energy from like the handmade heavens, the astral world, the, the, the energy, the unlimited source and drawing it in from nature and, and, and utilizing it for your will. Hmm. Okay. So then if I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly, so we do live in a reality of objectivity. There are objective elements of, of reality. We don't necessarily know what they are, yeah. but, but they're there. And, and in that, the natural world would probably be the closest approximation or the closest representation of what's objectively real in reality. Yeah. Um, and there are certain energies in the larger natural, in larger natural processes that can be tapped into to funnel into the ritual that you're talking about. And alternatively, we can generate it from within. So like a full moon or a new moon might have particular energies. Yeah. Um, uh, or like a, an, an ancient forest or a particular sort of like kind oh, of yeah. tree or something. Um, yeah. But then we could also generate it from within. And so yeah. when I, I'm curious about this generating it from within charging zero point state thing. Can you describe that a little bit? Because I mean... One of the things that you put in the book is that like you could do it just by like spinning in a circle and like jumping up and down listening to your favorite song. Like what what is yeah. this state? What does it feel like? Um it, it, because I feel like it might be more accessible than people might assume based on the language being used. Oh yeah yeah yeah. I think you know um it we we need you to get into an altered state of consciousness. And I think the <clears throat> altered state of consciousness can come not just from doing like ayahuasca or shrooms or something. You can you can do it right now at home, you know, burgeoning a level of energy like to the highest point, like the like the ravers who used to dance all night, you know, and, used to. and you know, we'll still do, <laughs> but you know, ravers that uh, dance all night and get into like a, a state of ecstasy or, or, or euphoria and it's basically when you feel so good that your mind is so clear and the clarity is that time to add in your desire and, and, and focus it towards something, focus it to the candle, focus it to the sigil. And, um, you can alter your state of consciousness from doing all different types of things, right? Like I say in the book, like in a state of fear, like a scary movie or something that you're afraid of, you know, shock yourself, then, then add in the desire or, you know, like I said, with music, you know, put on some really euphoric techno, big headphones, blast the, blast the music, or some pop music, whatever makes you feel good. Euphoria adds in the emotion, brings in the emotion, and, and get your emotions charged up because the emotions are the, the potent liquid that will charge your ritual and have you more likely to get the end result you want. But there's a bait and switch of that because if you're needy and you bring in lack into the ritual and desperation – well, you're probably going to get that mirrored back in your end result. And it took a lot for me to learn that. Hmm. Oh, as in like when you were er early on and you were, I can't remember, you said the, the, the ego facade or the ego monster facade was your language, that you thought you were manifesting all this stuff, but underneath all of it was just like this deep lack and inadequacy and whatever yeah. else that you're struggling with. And it appeared yeah. as though you were getting what you want, but you were just getting like rolling waves of a, 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 what you were actually asking for until you just got a whole lot of everything that you were subconsciously asking for all at once, which is that sort of like, I think crash that you said where you had to reassess what you were doing with your life. Is that sort of in my, in my own? Yeah, no, you're right. And I feel like even like now reflecting on that, like, I feel like I'm not saying I lost aspects of myself from doing those rituals from a place of lack, but there's, there's definitely something depressing looking back. Well, obviously it's a part of a positive event that, that triggered a really good healing process, but there's something sad about, uh, being unconsciously in a state of illusion and not understanding your desire only to get back what you're trying to avoid and living in this carousel and this cycle through 
occult practices. And, um, that, that really freaks me out because each time I, I would do a ritual, I would believe that I would feel better as a human. And I did for 10, five minutes, the high, when I got the thing that I want, and then I would crash. And that's, that's not good. <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, you started, we started this conversation with, uh, with a, a critical deconstruction of the, th how the theater of modern society and the propaganda that goes along and the impact of all that propaganda into our minds is to make us c consuming materialistic type consuming people that are constantly seeking sort of through object regulation, some form of escape from our own suffering to yep. the point in which that at some point for a lot of people, they end up realizing that they have finally managed to achieve the goals that they thought would free them from suffering, but there's only just more meaninglessness and suffering on the other side of it, which is often the midlife crisis. And what yeah. you're saying here is that, um, is that magic for you in the beginning was the very same thing that we were criticizing society as making us want. Or making yeah. us move towards. Yeah, because I was a byproduct of that society. I believed that this would be it once I could see myself as an as a you know, um, uh, something bigger than myself, something huge, something valid to society, something with with approve with approval, you know, around celebrities, around people of power. If I could see myself as that. And that would solve all of my suffering. It would go inside, heal all of my wounding. And that would just be it. That would be the solution. And um, going into to that magic, um, being a completely different person back then, um, it's, it's kind of sad to me because it, the chaos that I caused through these rituals that I created – as a way to, you know, survive them to get the, to get the things that I want, the chaotic events that came. I look back at now, I am now and I'm like, well, of course it was a part of my growing process, but at what cost, you know, at what cost and why? And when all the, that whole time, I just wanted to feel connection and love and friendship and validation and things that, that I believed that were um, impossible to achieve and that I had to go through these huge spiritual ladders and climb them to get like a sense of love. And when it, when I would get it, it would just be like a morphine drip, like a shot of it. And then it would be gone. And I didn't know that when I was doing that, I thought it would be like real long lasting fulfillment. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just reflecting on this on this hurt people hurt people. You know, even when you're trying to do good, even when you think that you're, you know, you're working towards what you think is good, what you think is good for you, what you think is good for others, what you think is going to help and doesn't help. Ultimately, yeah. when we're still hurt and we're operating from a place of hurt, conscious or another, we ultimately end up hurting people. And I think that's the recognition of that is a really important journey into maturity. Um, I mean, from a very little literal or a material world standpoint of like growing up and being a better person, but then also maybe in it from a magical standpoint as well as recognizing that like, Hey, I have to be careful with what I ask for and how I ask for it because I'm not, I'm no longer willing to harm other people because I know how much harm I have felt and, and how much guilt and remorse that I have felt. And I no longer want to participate in creating that in reality for myself or anyone else. And I think that points to something you were saying about, um, oh, I forget the language about like abstract outcome versus definite yeah, outcome. Yeah, specific outcome. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you want to comment on what I just said and then maybe explain what you mean by the abstract and specific outcome as well. Yeah, I, I think what you said was very beautiful and articulate. I, I really agree with you. It, it's almost like a sense of magic m maturity, but also, per, you know, that's why I think I didn't discover magic, and even though I was very mature at 21, but um, I'm happy I didn't discover it at 16, you know, who would have known what I would have done with magic at that age, uh, you know, or when people discover, I know people who have discovered magic at 13 to 14, and they're still, for, for hexes and curses they did, they're still suffering today mm. for the for the Akashic attributes of, of what they, what they, what they did. It's still they still face turmoil, turmoil today. So this stuff for me is real. And, you know, I believe in its power and, uh, you know, pers personally, how I, how I feel about the, 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 the growing up with, with magic is, is that I think it led me 
to my my to Kabbalah, to the Sephirot, to the to to understanding my a, a higher form of consciousness that exists outside of the material world that is very easy to access and just takes a lot of conscious present moment work. But um, the chaos of illusions is, is not seductive to me anymore, especially in the 2020s when my desires were almost expired from a different, from a wounding, wounding childhood wound that came from a whole different world really at the time when I was a child and, and adding that into rituals and, and seeing what mirrored back was very weird. Um, abstract outcome and specific outcome magic are very uh, different because abstract outcome is more like, well, I trust the universe and I trust what I'm uh, asking for to be handled by the universe in a place of um, not looking for a specific result, not looking to uh, hurt anyone. Well, obviously I wouldn't want anyone to hurt anyone through magic, but I mean like not putting higher risk with my desire, kind of having a safer sanitized desire. Whereas a specific outcome, people are involved, you know, uh, the gatekeepers are involved. Emotions are involved. Feelings are involved. Humans are involved. And if you're in that, Hyper focused state of, oh, well, I just need to get to my goal. I need to go to get to my desire. And I, I believe and I trust my ritual and I'm programmed by my, my ritual to just get there. You can become someone different than who you are to get what you want. And it's not good. Mm -hmm. And I guess other people can suffer the consequences. And, and I mean, like my, my dabbles are minimal. So I'm going based on sort of like the, the, the reality that is situated from the logic that we're sharing here to make this assumption, which is that I could make a specific outcome of like, I want that person to give me that job. And it's like, that's it. And I don't care how it happens. I don't care who has to suffer to get it. That's what I want compared to maybe a ritual being like, I want to get a job offer that brings me into a career that, yeah. that, that feeds my inspiration and helps me do good in the world rather that's than I want that specific job. Yeah. 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 Because, because the, when you learn that free will is expired and, and, you know, defunct and it's, you know, f for me, I see free will as like having a CEO and operator of yourself that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing or, and when you surrender to a higher version of your will, which would be divine will and trusting the divine and trusting a higher will than your own, um, I feel like that can create a way more fulfilling process, uh, spiritual process in the long run. But I do think you need to at first use your free will to get the things that you want to then move up to divine will. Does that make sense? I think it kind of makes sense. And then to, to auto correct along the way, cause chances yeah, yeah. are you'll hurt yourself. Yeah, preferably, yeah. preferably we all do our absolute best to harm as few people on our way to being good people as possible, but that's not always there's a significant portion of that that's not in our control until it have is you and, had, like desires that you were f hyper focused on and that you wanted and they created chaos. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then realizing afterwards that, that the result of which gave me what I wanted, but hurt too many people along the way and that the relationships with those people were more important than what I was getting. Actually, in, in fact, I would say that, a great example of that was in my early twenties when I like, I wanted to be high and popular. I, like basically I wanted to be a part of like the cool kids, popular drug taking kids and be like popular in that, in that culture when I was living in uh, Melbourne. And so getting high and hanging out with the people who had the best drugs and had the best parties were, was number one priority and in the course of that, I damaged several relationships um, yeah. beyond repair with people who genuinely cared for me and essentially gave up trying to help me because I was so selfish. Now, mind you, I also established friendships in those times with other people who I continue to this day have deep, beautiful relationships with because we went into it 
and found each other in the midst of it together and also all sort of like in our own way came out of it recognizing together like this is not what we want and so we shared that journey through and out of that type of lifestyle but that would be for me the most sort of like accessible immediate example of how me wanting to get what I want exactly how I want it resulted in hurting things, which were oh, yeah. people and relationships that in hindsight, those relationships and staying in good relationship is so much more important than whether or not I'm high and liked by the other people who were high. But see, this is, this is the challenge, the new age world and, and, and the, the visualization thing and magic in itself is, you know, our ideal self from our ego of our hologram of our desire of who we want to project into the world. Is that truly our higher self or is that just an essential uh, aspect of, of who we are in the present moment and the ego that we have and, and our own narcissism and our own, our own desire? Because really when you had those desires, all you were asking for was, I want to belong. Mm -hmm. I want to be seen. I want to be noticed. I want to be recognized. I don't want to feel a part of something higher than me. And, you know, those are all great desires. And those are all yeah. desires that we can get without all of that chaos. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we can get those needs met without all of those chaos. Yeah. But I think it was written for you to go the, through those experiences that you did because you got to learn what you learned. And I find it very interesting because hearing that background with you um, being in Melbourne and wanting to be a part of the high society drug kids and all that stuff. Did you, I wouldn't say high society more like just like the cool kids. <laughs> yeah. Cool kids. Yeah. But, um, just like a metaphor, but like the yeah. cool kids, I would feel like, did you ever feel like the uh, illusion of that was, was also like an, a byproduct of a sense of unconscious lack? Oh yeah. I mean, at the time, at the time, there's there's a whole story around it. It was actually funny. There's an overlap, which is like, I took LSD one time while I was super depressed, my first time. And I realized like, wait a minute, I can be creating my own reality, essentially. And I'm creating the suffering. I could create something else. And what I wanted to create was this, like, this new person in this new place. And what I created was exactly what I got. And it was good until it was actually bad and hurting myself and hurting the relationships around me. And then it was sort of like a... I think that there was like another LSD trip that exposed that to me. And then also I, I entered into a psychosis at one point, thankfully a, a mild one, but a drug induced psychosis at one point too, which sort of like challenged me to be like, the, like the world I think I'm in right now, I don't think it's, I don't think it's real. Like in hindsight, if I were to, if I were to take sort of a, a lens of, of how I would do integration work now from a hallucination or a vision and, um, <clears throat> and sort of deconstruct its root and meaning and meaning make around it. And I look at that time, I thought that I lived in dark city, that Melbourne, yeah. Melbourne was the only place that existed and that it wasn't real. And that my, that, that my sense of there being a world outside of it wasn't real. The only thing that existed was Melbourne, that if I were to even try to leave the city, I would only just end up back on the other side of the city kind of thing. I would only just end up coming back over and over again, like the movie Dark yeah. City. Um, and that there were maybe dark entities, I didn't know, but it felt like there was nothing and, and that that was my psychosis and I needed to prove to myself that there was a world outside of Melbourne. And then in hindsight, I could say like, oh yeah, like that was, that was me getting to a place where I was losing so yeah. much grip wow. on what was real that I started feeling as though, like recognizing from a hallucination standpoint, my subconscious was trying to say to me like, hey, yeah. you know, like you're forgetting. It just did it flip. It's like you're forgetting that what you think is your life here is not the only thing that exists. And it called me to do that in this reverse way by making me think as though it was the only thing that existed. Um, that, that was my psyche sort of effort to compensate and move towards healing. So cool. But I don't know if I would say that it was written for me. I don't know if I would, I would be on that same train. I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about destiny or fate, but certainly in hindsight, it's undeniable to say, it's undeniable that the things that I passed through were necessary for me to get to where I am. Um, and that where wow. I am is where I am, I really like. And so there's a, there's a love and trust for what I've learned along the way and how it's, a, how I continue to learn and apply it into my life. And the, and the, the stimulus is that brought me through that learning as being things that I have gratitude for, even if there are still things that I still hold sadness, grief, remorse, shame, embarrassment, guilt around. Yeah. I still have a sense of like, okay, 
those things are real, the, that guilt is real, the reason for that guilt is real, and also I'm really grateful for the, for the learning opportunity that that, that, um, that, that mistake and the harm it caused others or that, or, or other, or other people, um, like off, offered me. Um, yeah, I know it's not, it's like a weird sort of like selfishness on, on a level too, but maybe I have to check that in myself. Yeah. Well, per, I, I find that to be incredible how you, your psyche communicated to you in a visual experience and literally kind of took you on this like VR ride of a metaphor of where you were at and where you're in your life and what you needed to work on and what you needed to change and, and where you needed to go from there. And I think that's incredible that you were able to enter, enter that state, even though it was probably scary um, at times. And, but I think that the power in that is, is that you were able to kind of essentially go into like a dream sent from your unconsciousness, but the, but, but so lucid and so real and to experience it and, and the, and the re registering the emotion and the experience reflecting on it and how hardcore it was really was like your, your, the high, whatever, whatever spiritual dimension sending you into really wanting to, to work on yourself, which is very interesting to think about is, is that what if there are angels or upper worlds or people or in our, our higher selves or whatever, you know, essential aspects of ourselves that wants us to grow and go forward. And literally in a drug state induced state, you were being pushed to go forward and escape the prison of the cycle of, of where you were. And I think that's really beautiful. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure about the angels. Again, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about it, but definitely I'd never actually interpreted it that way until now. Like I, I mean, just like any significant experience looking back on it, the meaning of a thing changes and grows over time and certain aspects of what can be learned can only be learned in high, in, in a hindsight of significant distance and, and that distance being, um, that distance having been a necessary component of the context from which we look back in hindsight yeah. to derive the meaning and understanding of a thing. Um, so I hadn't really thought of it that way before. Um, but that's cool. Like how I just pointed out around my psyche and I appreciate your, I think about this sometimes too. Like, are there, are there higher beings that are, that are like on my team? I don't know. Yeah, rooting I don't know. for you. Like, are they, I did actually, Oh wait, no, I can't share this. I, I, sometimes I get calls from my, from my mind that certain stories aren't to be shared in certain contexts. And I just got that now. So I'm not going to, I'm going to actually totally like shift. I'm going to talk about a, a very spiritual experience I had, but I don't okay. right now. I was like, I was like, mm, don't share that in this context. And I don't think it's you. I just think it's the sort of like, um, the somewhat, impulsive excited unchecked desire to just like tell a thing that's actually very like deeply meaningful to me in a podcast situation where i haven't thought about the impact of yeah no no, no. protect context. that protect yeah. that so i'm gonna protect just hang that. i'm gonna hang on that and then i'm just gonna like totally protect that I, i'm gonna punt and redirect back to back to rituals okay so yeah. we you gave us the anatomy of the ritual you know that it's it can be anything it's basically you utilize props to represent like represent sort of the non-physical spiritual yeah. energies and, or the, the things that you want in your will. And then you have a, you do a theater kind of dance play with the props that has some sort of symbolic representation for how it's interweaving with the energies of the natural world called in or the energies of the natural world called up from yourself to, to f fuel that ritual with a intensity and then the ritual is done and then you let it go kind of thing. Um, yeah. And you pointed towards sigils. Uh, I point towards sigils and then also candles. Um, sigils, from what I understand, and it was my first encounter, is probably the easiest and most accessible way to do a magical ritual. So maybe for the people here who are going to be getting this just about Halloween, which I think is pretty much on a blue moon, which is cool. Yeah. Um, that they want to try to like experiment with what, what this is, what would a sigil ritual look like? What is a sigil, sigil, excuse me, and how would they go through making a sigil ritual perhaps on, on Halloween if they wanted to? Well, sigils, I have trouble with sigils because there is kind of like a, a formula towards sigils where you have to, you know, cut out the vowels and, you know, write, write out your desire and, 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 and create a, create a shape. But I would say, you know, why don't we get a little creative for this blue moon and, you know, draw a symbol 
of of something that you think is a magical symbol and charge it with your desire and um, activate it, you know, and, and get yourself in a zero mind state before, which would mean like alter your state of consciousness with the sigil, uh, you know, dance, do what you have to do and, and then direct the energy towards the sigil that you draw. So just to give it as like a picture, a symbol that you draw, whatever your own logo of your desire in that moment, the logo of your intention, you know, go through that, draw that in and, um, uh, destroy it after, you know, after you're done, burn it, um, after you charge it. So, but you can charge it with like masturbation and, and other ways as well. Semen, blood, whatever you need to do to charge it. But you can also, uh, by putting that on the sigil if you need to. And, um, but I, well, basically with masturbation, you have to think of the sigil, like when you're about to orgasm and climax. So if you're going to do that, you have to see the symbol in your head. I fucking suck at sigil magic. So I'm not the best at this question, but, um, uh, and I hated writing that chapter. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, Oh my God, that fucking chapter. Um, but I feel like, uh, w- with the, with the sigil magic, you can destroy it after, which is probably the freeing, most freeing process, which is, uh, erasing it. Um, well, I mean, sorry, uh, ripping it up, burning it, putting it in water, soaking it get rid of it and let it let that symbol fall to the deepest aspect of your subconscious mind and think of it as a seed that just planted your desire into the universe and that that aspect of sigil magic is really cool um i found it very tedious personally i always found it very difficult and everyone's like even my editor was like it's the most simple form of magic why do you hate doing this so much i'm like i just like candle magic so much more makes me feel like so much more magical for some reason so yeah, I, I think people should check out your book if they want to do want to do some candle magic. But I do have a personal question, which is like, do you reuse the same candle? You just blow out the flame and then the ritual's done. I reuse candles for sure. I've reused candles for like six years, you know. So I I like to reuse candles to bring a synchronicity to it and to uh, bring a sense of momentum and rhythm and repetition, which I find to be very powerful, like a momentum to the magic. But um, you can use different candles if you want to. You know, you don't even have to light it if you don't want to, you know, you just do what you want. Just, I, I think candle magic almost enters me into a dream mind state. I, I literally forget like who I am after candle magic rituals. Like I don't even, I look back on candle magic rituals and I don't even remember most of them hmm. because I'm in such a state of focus. Hmm. Yeah. I think, w- I, I don't know if it's my own sort of, uh, you know, like, desire to be seen a certain way, a desire to be understood a certain way or not be judged or something. But part of me is coming up and thinking about sort of the general tone of most of my interviews and how this topic is, and the way that we're talking about it, is not in contrast, but significantly left field for the sort of pretty rational type thinking that a lot of a lot of the episodes sort of explore things with. And I don't think we're necessarily being irrational, but anytime something like magical energy or something like that is mentioned, the inclination is to just detach that from what is rational. Yeah. Um, And so I have that there. And I'm also want to invite people if they've made it this far, if they've managed to keep listening, having had some sort of judgmental reaction at the beginning to not worry about whether or not what you're saying is real or not real, but just see what happens. Like, that's my mind. I'm like, I don't know if this candle magic stuff is real. It sounds pretty hokey pokey to me from my perspective. And also, so did also sigil magics brought me a lot of stuff. And this is my own biases about not wanting to look like a, be a certain way or not wanting to accept that certain things I might like certain things, you know, or, or whatever it is. And so I, that's why I asked the question. I'm like, I'm a, I'm gonna just straight up give this a try. And if it doesn't work, then I'll either, try again, or I'll chalk it up to being like, well, I did it wrong or it's bullshit. I don't know, but I want to try it because I'm curious because if all this magic stuff you're talking about has, has actual practical application, which I've noticed it has for me and the times I've explored, explored with it, then, well, it's a pretty valuable thing to have on hand. And there are some, there are some things that I would like to have included in my life. You know, like I would love to, I would love to charge up things like, like the, 
health and longevity of my relationship. I'd like to charge up things like I'd like to put charge into sort of like the well-being of the people that I love or yeah, of, yeah. of my of my financial security moving moving through COVID or whatever yeah. it is, right? Like I'd like to charge some of these things up. And if it's, I mean, it's no loss on my part to like try out this magic thing and it works or it doesn't. I'm not going to rest on my laurels with the rest of my life by any means. But um, so that's why I'm curious. And maybe maybe people listening haven't made it this far into the interview because they already judged and stepped away. Um, Or maybe they're still just giving it a chance and maybe they'll give it a chance. Cause I, I I think it's, I think it's interesting stuff. And I'm curious to see what happens for me. Yeah. And I think, like I say in the book, most people who practice magic, we believe that magic bypasses belief and bypasses whatever limit limited egoic thoughts we have about the occult because it's so fucking bigger than us and above us and that you know uh i was very cynical about magic in the beginning when i was doing this stuff it was like are you fucking kidding me like like i was the most depressed like apathetic human being i hated positive thinking i hated positive people i hated all of it i thought it, everything was materialist and the world was suffering and I was atheist and agnostic and I hated everyone. But um, I was like, I am so fucking powerless. Like at this point in my life, like I'm going to fucking try this shit. I'm going to, you know, what do I have to lose? I've lost so much already. I'm just going to just fucking practice magic. And it ended up working out for me. And it works out for a lot of people because I think it brings back a sense of agency into your life, brings back an idea of control, but also that's dangerous in itself too. You know, because mm-hmm. the idea of attachment to control through magic can make a lot of people crazy because they're like, I can control my reality. Well, you can influence reality. You can send out an energy to the ether. And if it comes back to you, yeah, that's like a, a semblance of control. But uh, I personally believe in a, a, a submitting in a way to a to a, a divine map of my own life of 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 you know, if I'm not going to get everything I want, um, not what I mean by that is if I'm not going to get the exact thing that I want in the present moment, that doesn't mean that I won't get something similar to in the future, you know, kind of being optimistic because I found that being negative about life doesn't really make life any easier. Hmm. I mean, yeah, (laughs) that's pretty fair. It just, uh, I mean, maybe gives us a, maybe gives us meaning, some sort of weird distorted meaning for our suffering. You know, if all life is suffering and who cares and fuck everybody, then there's like a certain degree of this weird twisted pseudo control there. Yeah, Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so interesting to think about, like the atheists and the agnostics almost try to control their reality by depriving themselves of believing in something higher than themselves it almost becomes like a level of solipsism and an ego and like i exist i am my own god and the i exist for my present moment pleasures and nothing matters and fuck everyone and i'm just going to go after everything that i want in in a way of instant gratification that are going to give me these short euphoric bursts and leave me low again whereas i think anyone on a spiritual path is personally looking for a long lasting fulfillment. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think it's fair to, to, to summarize all atheists in that way. Although you might enjoy a, an article that was written by someone who, uh, whose work I really like, he's an idealist and it was actually published in a philosophy, like a peer reviewed philosophy book, which was, um, about, uh, what's it called? Uh, physicalism as a neurotic ego defense mechanism. And he breaks down the ideology of physicalism um, it's piece by piece and how it like perfectly fits inside of Freud's description of what a neurotic ego defense mechanism is. But let's, let's move on from that actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although it's probably fun. I don't want to, I want to go on to that. I want to get into two forms of magic uh before we go and, and and I think that they're going to, you know, people are going to find these interesting, which is drugs and sex. Yeah. And I'm, I was surprised. I want to start with drugs um, because I want to end, I want to end with sex. I want sex to be the ending of this, right? Yeah. Uh, the end all. Uh, so I, you mentioned drug magic in the book. You mentioned, you basically stressed high, con- high caution. Yeah. And then, 
I, you might have made one or two references after that, but otherwise you didn't really explore it at all. It's like after you expressed caution, it was like the rest of the book was basically like, it was like, uh, yeah. yeah, don't use drugs. We won't even talk about it kind of thing. But yeah. can, you, can you talk a bit about drug magic now? And I, I would love for you to, to also weave in how your struggles with addiction have formed your opinion on drug, ma- drug magic, if, if it has helped inform Yeah, that. of course it has. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I may, I think I, I think unconsciously, I feel like um, my opinion on drug magic probably comes from the fact that I can't do shrooms and psychedelics and 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 uh, do ayahuasca and do all these cool, you know, altered states of conscious shamanic drugs. But um, I think, you know, anyone who is not an addict and can do that kind of magic, and you can enter an altered state of of consciousness, like while doing magic, that sounds fucking amazing to me. You know what I mean? Like if you could just take a plant and do a ritual and, and like, I know people who are non-spiritual people who do shrooms and they see Maracaba spinning and they have spiritual awakenings and they lose so much, uh, attachment to the material world. And they, they're like, I know there's something bigger than me. And, and they have these spiritual connections. And if you can kick start that through drugs, go the fuck off, do it. But um, for me personally, because I'm an addict, I don't think I'd ever come home or I'd ever come back. I, it was all I would want to do if I got an exciting, imaginative, euphoric experience. So yeah, of course, of course, the caution, you know, came from my own ego in a way, I guess. <laughs> mm. Well, what makes you what makes you think that doing ayahuasca as an addict, doing ayahuasca would become problematic? Because I mean, well, ayahuasca. I mean, going in as an addict and going in specifically, maybe less with a sort of uh, less with a, I'm going in to do magic kind of thing. Cause I, I, I anticipate that you would likely find yourself, uh, out, out of, out of your league very quickly on a good dose of, uh, on a good dose of ayahuasca. Um, but from a place of going in, looking for healing around, around the stuff, like what makes you think that ayahuasca would, would worsen your addiction problem rather than help to move towards a greater resolution of it? Well, I'm sure I'm sure that it that there there is the possibility that it could be a solution, but because I have so much fear around how any time I've experimented with something that makes me feel good or creates a certain experience that is altered from an external source, I for some reason just cannot it's an unending desire to recreate and relive it and to chase it Mm -hmm. so that's my personal boundaries but for another addict who wants to take that risk and try ayahuasca to see if it heals their addiction Mm -hmm. that's fucking amazing i'm i'm all for that i'm all for that of course i'm all for unconventional plant medicine naturopathic let's go let's do it but for me personally from my own experience when i've practiced relating to things um in a way that I think is going to be non-addictive um, and it is euphoric. I'm just the type of addict where I'm addicted to anything and everything that makes me feel good. Like it's just, it's hijacked every area of my life. Hmm. Well, I, 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 I respect where you're coming from and, and how you're, how you're making sense of, of what you need in your recovery process. Um, so <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's move on to, um, to, to the end all be all the sex magic uh, talk to me a little bit about a little bit about sex magic and then I want you to also be setting the stage because I'm going to ask you a question about pornography in a minute um, but talk to me oh, a little yeah. bit first about uh, about sex magic what it is what its role is yeah well sex magic is when you 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 treat sex as a magical ritual where you are trying to synchronize you and your partner to a certain level, usually shared intention, or maybe you both have different intentions. And at, you know, climax or orgasm, you let out a rich uh, visualization or uh, um, an intention out to the universe. Um, So like for a guy, when you jizz, you would like, you know, have uh, uh, the desire that you want as you orgasm and you would be charging that energy with with it. But sex magic is really about alchemy, really. It's about recognizing that sex is a very powerful thing and a powerful, um, when you're horny, it's a very powerful emotional state that if you can redirect it, it sounds weird and fucking crazy, but if you can redirect it, you can 
accomplish things that you might not be able to accomplish. You know, you can transmute that, that high rage, no, not rage, high charged energy and, and direct it towards something and create something that maybe you didn't think you could. And, um, for me, it, I, f- I feel like that's also very empowering because when people are horny, most people feel like they can't control it and they're trying to alleviate or free themselves of something. But if you try to control that, the most carnal desire you have, um, I think that's very empowering and powerful. But but for sex magic, you can even do it with masturbation. Like, like you know, lots of people would charge sigils, like I said, while – you know, or, while like orgasming, like if, like right when they climax, they're like visualizing the symbol. And um, it's just, I think also sex magic can sometimes be about, you know, completely changing your relationship with, with what you've been taught about sex. You know, what is, what is your soul or your higher, higher self if you don't believe in a soul, but if, you know, if you only believe in a higher dimensional version of your own ego, you know, what would you, what would you describe sex as and, and, and constitute it as rather than what you've been taught what it is? Hmm. Yeah. I guess that, that sort of suggests to the sort of basics around magic, around, uh, being able to define, define yourself in accordance with your own deeper path and will rather than yeah. by the, the externalities of our, of the world, uh, as they have been sort of structured to make you a particular way. Um, one of the things you have a whole chapter about no fap. Um, and yeah. you explicitly, when you messaged me, I think when we were initially talking, you seemed excited to talk about no fap as a magical practice. Yeah. I um, think it's great. And, uh, why don't, why don't you go into that? Because my curiosity is, I mean, it's obvious. Okay. So you can utilize sexual energy to accomplish a thing right? Say in your magical ritual, but also what I heard you suggesting is if instead of moving towards the alleviation of the, des- of the arousal, I, I yeah. again, Stephen Jenkinson talks about desire's goal is to extinguish itself, um, and create space for more of itself. Yeah. Um, so it's like, instead of being like, Oh, I feel like I have this arousal. I should extinguish it by satisfying the desire of something erotic, particularly pornography. Um, I can transmute that into doing something else, which is so hard um, to transmute that into doing something else. Say like, yeah, yeah. no, I'm going to go for a run instead, for example. Yeah, yeah. And, and no, I think, yeah, no, you can continue. I was going to say NoFap is kind of based around that. But then my question is, what is the what is the magical perspective on what's happening there? And in particular, in the context of the impact of pornography on a person's sort of capacity to exert their will or their ability to, um, to harness and, and, and hold their own arousal energy. Yeah. So I think, um, you, you, you hit a great point, you know, about, uh, I am very passionate about NoFap and, uh, you know, the, not anti-porn because people are, I'm not anti anything really, but, um, I think the way that NoFap plays into magic is, is that it teaches you that that highest urgency in yourself that is so carnal, you can not give into it. You cannot give into your reactive instant gratification behavior. So whether you, when you have that high arousal and usually you would go to masturbation, porn to relieve it, you, what you can do is you can sit with it, you can allow it to pass, and then all it becomes is a sensation in your body or a feeling in your body. And then you can relate that to other areas of your life, like when you're angry or when you're sad or when you have emotions. You just see that it's just a desire flowing through you, pulsating through you. Personally, I think pornography, uh, especially with young men who grow up with hardcore pornography, is a way of um, mind-numbing and obliteration. And it's another form of addiction that is becoming normalized in our society and it, it needs escalations. It needs you, it needs new things, new kinks, things to get higher and higher. And you get more of a perverse version of your own sexuality through this imaginative hallucinatory world to the point where, um, I think now they're also creating like blow up dolls, sex dolls that look like porn stars and like VR porn and all this type of stuff. And like very healthy, good looking, normal young men, are, are turning to that as a solution because the fantasy is, is, and is so much more charged and, and controllable and objectifying 
towards women versus the reality of a sex life that you can't control or what maybe your partner doesn't want to do the things that you don't want to do. And you want to, you know, impose this really carnal masculine version of yourself onto another person. And I think, um, I think that, you know, sex hijacks our emotional energy it, uh, it it's a prison in a lot of ways because even though it's a beautiful thing in, in modern society, it's used as a distraction and an illusion to allure you into a state of captivity, an emotional captivity to then release your energy. But when you conserve it and you preserve it, um, you, there's a fulfillment to it. I don't know why, but for me at least, there's and, and many others, there's a fulfillment to it because it's like, wow. I got to see that the, the giving into that was just an emotional state and a sensation in my body and a desire and restricting it sort of fills my future self with more light in a way. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, especially from a place of, of the sexual desire being very mechanically driven towards release, um, be it with a partner or otherwise. Um, but I also, I, I, I don't, I, being in a long-term committed relationship right now where our sexuality is an incredibly important part of our, of the health and the bonding yeah. in our relationship. I also see that it is outside of that. It is not a trap and the actual sexual interactions, between, intimacy, the intimacy that can be driven through the power of, of, a, of, of sexuality and, and lovemaking is, is incredible. And also we can get stuck um, and I think this is why I was pointing out towards porn and nofap because the the evidence coming out dramatically is that you know the earlier you get onto the new media pornography, I'm not talking like yeah. mags, I'm talking about sex.com kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, the more it totally messes with your dopamine and arousal matrix neurobiologically, and as well as from a how do I relate to my sexuality thing, and for you know, for women, it becomes difficult to be aroused. And then for men, it becomes difficult to get an erection unless it's like super intense, not to mention the confusion of thinking that like, women love it when you slam your dick into the back of their throat, which is, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe some women do, but like, yeah, yeah. like it does, like sex isn't necessarily like hot sex isn't necessarily hardcore violence where there's a manipulation of, of especially young men's minds to think that and, and young women that sexual eroticism and sexual exchanges are actually are what pornography looks like but pornography is is often quite a violent very sort of like worst expression of male tox toxic um like toxic aspects of masculinity sort of represented as what the sex act is rather than it being a fantasy a fiction um that is this sort of dis can be quite a distorted entertainment um, and that's something that yeah. I've been, I've, I, I've been tracking for quite some time. And that, like you said, that can become addictive in its own right. I mean, if social media and television can be addictive and sugar can like, if social media and television can be addictive with it, absolutely can be because of the intensity it has on the dopamine response of seek, find, add porn into that. And I can't, I, I can't imagine why you would think that it wouldn't be addictive. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, you, you're, you're exactly right. You know, the manufactured produced illusions and fantasies and deception of the young minds and the young men who think that that's what that's, that's real makes the pursuit of sex to just be another extension of your ego and your fantasy and create, make you more disconnected and isolated from the body. Whereas what you're talking about is very unifying, connective, in a way, sex mag like sex magic sex, like very, you know, uh, um, alchemical union, merging, all of these beautiful things that you said that are very beautiful. But that that fulfillment, fulfilling experience is the antithesis to porn culture and mm -hmm. porn. Mm -hmm. And um, you also alluded to kind of, you know, what the futurists of the 1960s would say is that in, in a dystopian future, we, we would be mainlining virtual drugs without, you know, uh, having physical presence. And um, that's kind of what is happening with technology is, you know, we are, I think some doctors say that porn is, is, is more hardcore than like heroin on the brain or something, you know, or, the, or there's all these reports coming out, like you said. So, you know, the dopamine uh, receptor and the morphine drip of, of abusing your dopamine from a young age and even now and, and becoming addicted to that intensity, you also alluded to the intensity of it. 
it, it creates these multiple rewards that are extremely addictive. And um, I feel like we're going to see, hopefully, in the 2020s, people who, I mean, but also not everyone's an addict, right? There are some people who can watch porn once a day and masturbate to it and not be addicted. But or most, once a week. <laughs> yeah, or once or a less. week. And, yeah. and guys are, and then some guys are addicted, but the guys who are addicted um, usually live in denial about it to make the con- to make the connection that it's the porn that is that, that is has, has them in a compulsive, obsessive cycle. And um, I find that there probably is a very positive, sex-positive aspect for, for porn for some people in the world, and I allow people to have those experiences. But uh, personally, I feel like it is it only dehumanized all people to me, you know, in 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 in, in porn and, and like it 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 uh it created a very perverted, pers- like a uh, distorted version of sex that was removed from reality. Hmm. Yeah, that I had to program from like like on like remove it from my hard drive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could. I, I see what you're saying there, and and then also there's there's opportunity for porn as a technology to have a positive impact in someone's sexual life, um, yeah. as as well as the larger sphere of erotica um, to have a positive impact, even though it is fantasy and 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 whatever else. Um, but then, yeah, just like there's so many layers of how how what uh, we'll just say mainstream porn um, damages both like damages people with penises and people with vaginas yeah. um, in their ability to have healthy sexual interactions physiologically, as well as what they think they should be okay with and what they think sex is supposed to be, especially from like a young developmental standpoint. Um, I kind of feel like we've, we're shifting away into something that I'm like feeling really charged up about this thing that I didn't realize I had such a strong opinion about um, before we started talking about it. If you want to have any closing comments on it, please do. And then we can, uh, we can sort of like get a little bit more information about your book and then maybe come to come to a close in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, what I would say is, is, you know, if you are struggling with uh, an addiction to, to, to any type of fantasy, whether it's sex or love or porn, because there's love addiction as well, Mm -hmm. you know, realize that there are people behind the objectification of your own fantasy and that the pain that is underneath your need to leave and create fantasies of people and, and, and live in a fantasy world, you know, you, you could possibly use that for an alchemical uh, redirection, maybe create art, but you know, you have to view people for who they are and who they show who they show themselves as to you rather than project your idealism and put pressure on them. And that goes with sex and love and romance and, you know, try to get to know the people for who they are rather than who you want them to be. Yeah, I feel like that's just good. Just, I don't mean to justify, but like that sounds like good life advice in general. <laughs> um, so, Alex, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I really liked your book. Uh, I thought it was fun, pragmatic, very close to the point, easy to read, not too long, and lots of stuff in there to play with afterwards. Um, and you obviously seem to be quite a switched on fella. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, I don't know. I think I, I just assumed your gender. So pardon me about that, but you seem yeah, to be I'm quite real. a, uh, <laughs> might've, uh, you're quite a switched on person nonetheless. Um, so I appreciate you coming on the show. Maybe you could leave us with, uh, where people can follow up with your work, where they can, uh, access pop magic and, uh, maybe follow you online. Yeah. Uh, I have no social media accounts, so, um, you can buy the book in stores, wherever books are sold. Uh, you can go to www.popmagicwithak.com and alexkazemi.com. And if you like this episode and you have any questions for me, um, I'm very 1998 style. You can email me fanmail at alexkazemi.com and uh, just send me a letter. Tell me what you thought uh, and uh, how the episode made you feel. And if the book helps you, I would love to know about that. And uh Yeah. Great. Well, I'll make sure links to that are contained in the show notes to this episode at jameswjesso.com. Thank you, Alex, for your time today. Thanks for writing the book and uh, thanks for be- being you and being so transparent and honest with uh, with your journey uh, as, we, as we talked about some pretty sensitive stuff. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I hope it helps someone. And cut.
I hope you enjoyed that interview with Alex Kazemi, uh, and that you're going to check out his book, Pop Magic. Um, what you're looking at here on the screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, is a little bit of a look at the forest here that I'm in, uh, in Kitchener, Ontario, southwestern Ontario, Canada, about 90 minutes drive, depending on traffic, uh, from the 401. I'm sorry, from Toronto on the 401. And uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of the natural, very at this point, late autumn weather, uh, late autumn forest climate. Uh, as a way of celebrating this Halloween bonus episode. Um, because, well, being in Ontario in the fall is beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of bright reds anymore. Um, but uh, that just is what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not exactly the most satisfying. Um, but yeah, so that's it for this, that's it for this interview. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And... I hope you're enjoying the images that you're getting to see here on uh, on YouTube, this uh, beautiful forest that I'm in. If you like this episode, please share it on social media, share it with a friend, uh, and if you'd like to give financially to, show, to the show, I'd deeply appreciate that. You can go to jameswgesso.com forward slash support or look in the description to this episode wherever you are checking it out, uh, where you can find options like Patreon, PayPal, or cryptocurrency. There's also some things you can order from the shop if you want to get someone a, a uh, limited edition at mine podcast uh, blotter art or even some um, some books or some t-shirts as uh, as gifts for yourself or for others. Hey, that's an option and it also supports the show. So that's about it for me. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.